spreading the diversity in modern society. Thus, you will agree with me that we need today a spiritual revolution that is different from the scientific, intellectual, political, or industrial revolutions. It is the revolution of spirit that should embrace all of the positive results of the previous revolutions in the sense of the return to the light of God, Nur, a source of his light with which he enlightens human hearts and minds, which is light upon light, which expels darkness one over the other, which chases away darkness from human mind, which removes hatred from human heart, and which cleanses the human soul from evil. It is interesting to hear this saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Verily, God created the creatures in darkness, and then he poured them some of his light. It is this light that is God's light that has enlightened the human spirit and mind to lead humanity from slavery to freedom, from might to right, from mythology to science, from hatred to love, from terror to security, from fear to hope, from war to peace, from corruption to ethics, from poverty to well-being, from falsehood to truth, from selfishness to compassion, from arrogance to humility, from harshness to gentleness, from greed to modesty, from discrimination to equality, from pornography to chastity, from pedophilia to morality, from drug addiction to self-esteem, from godlessness to godliness, from suicide to the purpose of life, and from jahiliya ignorance to spiritual enlightenment. On paper, we have it all, freedom, right, science. But deep in our soul, we sense that we are losing these values as some people would like to take us back to the dark age of slavery, might, and mythology, or a jahiliya. Of course, science cannot replace the need of the soul to bear beyond what the ear can hear and to see beyond what the eye can see through enlightened intellect. But also human intellect which produces knowledge cannot renounce scientific achievements that have made man's life on earth easier. The call for a return to faith must not mean a return to the world of mythology in which the light of intellect and the power of reason deemed. A spiritual revolution does not imply erasing human sagacity and rationality. The spiritual revolution demands a return to wisdom, tolerance, and dialogue, notions that have been become lost in the flood of arrogance, egoism, extremism, holocaust, genocide, terrorism, and violence in the streets and in homes. We have reached a point when the very mention of the word wisdom usually makes one think of elderly people who are wise because they have gone old and can no longer be ruthless. Yes, ruthlessness has become what wisdom used to be for those who think that wisdom of life is to be found in narcotics, the wisdom of modern age in alcohol, the wisdom of freedom of choice in the lack of shame, the wisdom of wit and theft, and the wisdom of courage in violence. Of course, when one subjects his worldview to acquiring knowledge and information without morality and ethics, without wisdom and meaning, without decency and honor, without tolerance and the culture of dialogue, then we face violence, intolerance, and discrimination in society. And I want to share with you something of my Bosnian experience. And I would like you to remember this from my heart, not from what I have written. There are two principles. One is, the law is not in the book. The law is in the heart. So before we change the books, we have to change the human hearts. You can write whatever, whatever you like on the paper. But if human rights are full of hatred, and if they are like stones 
and even the stones are softer than some human rights, then it is useless. And the second thing is, the tolerance is a sign of strength, and intolerance is a sign of weakness. What it means? It means if you, are, if you know who you are, if you are sure about your identity, and you know uh, what is in your heart and mind, you don't mind others who are different from you. On the contrary, you like them. You know why? Because they are interesting to you, because they are different. Because if you have all the people who are same like you, it is really boring. <laughs> so you have to have somebody who is different, who will tell you something that you don't know, you didn't experience. So if you are intolerant, that means you are weak. But if you are tolerant, that means you are strong. So I want you to be strong as you are. That's the way we can survive on this planet. And then let me share with you something. I was born in uh, 92, uh, 52. <laughs> it is intentional mistake. <laughs> But my wife was born in 54. She's younger, two years. And I went to my elementary school and my high school in ex Yugoslavia. And we learned all the, uh, let's say, all the books that were available at that time. And it was emphasized for us that religion is finished that Marx said that, de that God is dead and that the religion is dead. And, but I want to tell you that uh, Marx is dead, <laughs> but religion is still alive. And God is alive. Just take this information seriously. And then we were, talked, we were uh, taught that in the mosque, the Imam told us that we are from Adam and Eve, and Hawa, Eve, and God has created everything. Then we go to school and the teachers tell us, no, 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 you are not created by God, but you somehow developed by the process of evolution. And Darwin was the star, all the teachers. So, of course, I have to learn both. And I have to be, get the grade A or B or C. Depends how I know that. And when I, went, when I go to mosque, I like my imam, what he says. When I go to school, I pretend that I like my teacher. <laughs> so, but while, while, uh, as I was growing up and learning more and more, and trying to figure out who is right. Is it my imam or my teacher in the school? Well, as I became imam and became teacher in the mosque and so on and so on, all in, all is still in my mind this kind of, you know, puzzling, I want to know who is right. So I made kind of investigation myself. And wish that Darwin comes back. And if he would come back, I would like to ask him or to tell him one thing. Dear Darwin, we like your effort. You are a great scientist, no doubt about it. We appreciate it. See, we are, to, we are told in the Hadith that any hikmah, wisdom that is lost, you have to find it and, you know, to learn it. But I would tell him, in the meantime, as you were absent, I was observing the world, and I did not see any monkey that became a man. <laughs> really. But, on the other hand, I did see many men who became monkeys. <laughs> Let me, you, you should understand me what I say. I am speaking you from the city of Sarajevo that was besieged for four years. I saw mothers, widows, who lost six sons. I saw a family that lost 200 members. The names of them are 
written in the cemetery of Srebrenica. And this symbol here, the white is uh, innocence and the green is our call for reconciliation in Bosnia. You know that my people at the end of last century suffered genocide just because we were different of religion and culture. And this is why I appreciate that you invited me to talk to you because you understand what is diversity and you understand what is polarity and we understand in Sarajevo what it is. So may God protect Singapore and my country Bosnia that we show to the whole world that it is possible to live in a diversity of cultures and plurality of religions. This is the only way we can go to the future. No other way. Never, never in the history was only one religion, one culture, one language, one people. And some people in this globalized world want to make us one. They want us all to drink, let's say, Coca-Cola, or if you like, or, or I, I, not only Coca-Cola, probably. Depends who can produce more. And then, then you, they teach you how to, you, they teach you how you like that what they produce, and they make the uh, such adver advertising that you cannot reject. But, but eat and drink and, and dress, what they tell you is the most beautiful. Believe me, listen what I say, eat what you like, not what they told you, and dress what you like, not what they tell you, and you will be beautiful and you will be healthy. Therefore, the pollution of the human soul with lies and immorality is no less harmful than the pollution of the nature with poisonous gases and garbage. Moreover, it is not possible to cleanse nature as long as human soul remains polluted with wickedness and irresponsibility towards life on earth. What we hear, what we hear around us, all this pollution, is not from the nature, it is from us. You know, the, the whole waste that we have in the nature, it is food for somebody else. But what we produce as a waste is the death for others, including us. So this is the difference between automatic survival of the nature and our not automatic, but we have to learn everything because we have the reason. Men must learn tolerance and a culture of dialogue because there is no other way that can that can contribute to his success in this world and his salvation in the hereafter. It is because of the lack of human compassion for all forms of life on earth and because of the absence of true tolerance and a culture of dialogue among people and nations that the 20th century will be remembered as the century of dark ideas of racism, fascism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, the ideas that have in introduced use people to commit the most heinous, heinous crimes in history of mankind. Death comes, gulags, and the atomic bombs that fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki killed millions of people more than in any other century. However, the 20th century is not only notorious for the numbers of those killed, but also because of the conviction that out of these, of those killings, and a new better world would be born. In the 20th century, industries of killing organized by states against its own citizens were launched with the conviction that those who survived without would live in a better world than was ever existed. In the 20th century, men tried to replace the divine spirit with a satanic evil spirit daring to utter the words, God is dead, because becoming conceited in thinking that he can live as if there were no God. But today, those of us who have survived the dark moments of the 20th century can bear witness that God is El Hai, the ever-living Alhamdulillah. So, you are not alone down here. Living God is always with you even if you are ignorant of him. You may be far from God for a while, 
But you cannot live without God because God has breath in you of his spirit that made you alive, that made you feel, see, smell, touch, and enjoy the diversity of God's creatures of which you are just a tiny human being who should not feel lonely in this endless diversity of natural and human expressions, who should be happy in this beautiful and prosperous lion of city, Singapore, in this hospitable and loving Singapore society with many faiths, cultures, and friends. My wife, Azra, and I are proud to be among your friends. Thank you, and may God bless you and protect you. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shay. Uh, he has given us a lot of food for thought, um, many ideas, many suggestions, many views for us to reflect on. Sorry, this thing has a sticker down. I don't know why. Um, we have about an hour and a half. There are microphones on the aisles. I won't attempt to summarize this lecture. I think it would be good if we could invite those who may have comments to add on or even queries to the Shea. Can we invite, please, the first speaker or the first commentator? Anybody would like to start the ball rolling? Mr. Zainal, please. We are very honored and privileged to have you here. Since I have to leave for another function for hard to send off, I hope you'll forgive me. I'd like to ask this question. You shared with us a lot about what's happened this century, all the atrocities and what's happened in Bosnia and many other places in the world. I'd like to ask you this question. Have we really learned the lesson? Has the world really learned the lesson? Is inter-civilizational dialogue, which we see now everywhere, really achieving what we want to bring about in terms of better tolerance, better understanding, better acceptance. And how much of the problem, the challenge we have now is because of the others, the others, or is it really because of us, ourselves, the Muslims? Thank you. Well, I, it is easier always to blame others for uh, Taylor and it is difficult to accept uh, self-criticism all or to accept uh, uh, to accept uh, uh, re-examination of your own contribution to what is there. But I, there is one there is one uh, fact that uh, we we Muslims are uh, faced with and the rest of the world do not understand us. I think there is a big misunderstanding between what we want to say to the world and what the world is expecting from us as Muslims. And we live a big crisis as Muslims in terms of explaining ourselves. Either we don't know how to explain or the others don't have uh, goodwill to listen to us what we say. Uh, I would uh, uh, say regarding the current uh, uh, situation of the Muslim history, uh, I will try to describe it in this way. Coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, at the beginning of seventh century and bringing this idea of Islam into the world affairs was the most radical reformation in religious thought in the history of mankind. And I will tell you now why. It was the Prophet Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, whom we believe received the wisdom from the heaven. And this idea of getting information from the heaven was not new. We, uh, uh, in his time, there were people who believed that there was a communication between the heaven and the earth. There was idea of the covenant with God. The availability of the uh, knowledge 
about the Old Testament Torah and the New Testament Injil was available not to all the Arabs, but there were people who knew it. And the idea of the connection and the covenant in terms of God will do some, for you this if you do this. And this covenant that Adam signed first, then Noah, Nuh signed on our behalf, then Moses, Musa alayhi salam signed on our behalf, and then Isa alayhi salam confirmed what was signed on our behalf. And then Prophet Muhammad was uh, given the uh, book of the Quran saying, you are now the prophet of God, you have to sign now the covenant with God, and this covenant with God is valid whether you know it or not. All right. Now, with this idea uh, of reformation, I would mention just uh, two or three. First, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he canceled the institution of priesthood. He said, La Rahbaniyat fil Islam. No mediation. You are free. Your, you are, your personal faith matters. The second, the Prophet Muhammad canceled the idea of racism. He announced in Arafat that no superiority of an Arab or non-Arab or white, everyone is equal. Kullukum in Adam wa Adam in Turab. You are all children of Adam. So no, no discrimination based on race, on color, on anything. And then the third, the most important thing that I think the Muslims, the we, did, did, not, uh, in, in, did not spread, in, did not advertise in a good, good uh, manner, is the principle of no compulsion in religion, la ikrah This is the basic of the human rights. You don't use force for, to persuade, uh, to on others they believe. Now, what I'm trying to say, and, and I would add the third one, and that is that each and every man is born free of sin. No guilt by birth. You are born, you are coming from God free. This world that we live is dirty. So the only, the, the wisdom of this life is that you go through this life as much uh, so that you don't get dirty as much as you can. You will get some, don't, no, no way that you will get uh, without being dirty. And, but you, your uh, smart or your success is in the way that you don't get too much. Okay. Now, this is, the bo this is the most radical reformation in religion. You, you check the, what they call reformation, you will see. Now, Prophet Muhammad came in a very Bedouin uh, mentality, if you like, it's except Mecca. He was born in the city, urban city. And he didn't ha have army. He didn't have any plan, strategy, like we have today, to conquer the world. But he has only a message, a word. This word that he brought from, from Arab Peninsula was spread in such a, a vast area, in such a speed, and you cannot compare it uh, with any other idea spreading in such a way. Two civilization where Persian and Byzantine were accepting this idea. Now, this from these two civilization, we got a, something we call Islamic civilization in Baghdad and everything. And Muslims were, uh, were the center for scientific uh, research and so on. I don't need to, to go to this. What I want to come is to the uh, 19th century. This high civilization of Muslims suddenly uh, went to the margin of history. And the Muslims became, and their civilization and everything, on the margin of history. And in 18th century, I should recall you, that three main European powers controlled 85% of the, of, the, of, the, of the globe. 
the British, the Italian, and the French. Now, most of that globe that became under the control of these three great powers previously was in the hands of Muslims. So Muslims had two choices, either to make hijra or to fight against this occupation or uh, colonization or whatever. Now, this uh, drama of the Muslim history is, is, is now almost two centuries. In these two centuries, you had two movements in the Muslim history. One is the idea of re-Islamization of Muslims, and the other was secularization of the Muslim mind. The secularization of the Muslim mind was not a Muslim product. It was imported into Muslim lands from the West. Because the idea of secularization, secularism is the European Western idea. It is, they, it is their product. Now you can buy it, you can take it, but it is not yours. So many of the Muslim students went to the West to learn how to adapt secularization into Muslim lands, so-called modernization and so on. Now, Turkey succeeded and sacrificed a lot, Tunisia, Indonesia, and many, many countries. But the Muslims did not see the benefit from this. Muslims did not achieve social justice, except in Turkey. So uh, if we take Turkey as a model, I wish that all Muslim countries went to the process of secularization, like Turkish. But with the great sacrifice. Now, the movement of re-Islamization that was initiated basically by the Pakistani Alim Kabir, al Mawdudi was theoretical and it was educational. But then we had the uh, military wing, wing, uh, military wing of that, which is basically had, uh, led by Sayyid Qut in Egypt, who thought that he should implement the re-Islamization not by education but by military force and you know uh, organizing Muslims to fight physically I don't need to tell you now what happened with this but this state of affairs of Muslims trying to get back to the mainstream of history is, is on the minds of all intellectuals uh, if the modernization of the Muslim societies, meaning secularization, was successful. If this process of, let's say, secularization of the Muslim countries brought Muslims justice, social justice, uh, economical prosperity, and uh, educational, uh, you know, uh, vigor and educational uh, superiority and so on, I think that Muslims would accept this idea of you know, building the society. Unfortunately, they modernist, these modernists failed, in my opinion. And therefore, we have, not, uh, then, the re-Islamization was strengthened by uh, many groups until we get to the Iranian Revolution, which was led by the ulama, by the mullahs. And they say, you know, you secularist, you modernist, you don't know. You don't understand the feeling of the Muslims. You don't express their, their uh, aspirations. We are the ones who will lead them. And they led them, and they succeeded. And now this pattern of success of the Iranian revolution was spread around. And then we have what we have, the secularism was withdrawing. People more and more were uh, farther and farther for, from the idea of modernism, of secularism of the West. And they say, you know, you see how they succeeded, so we have to come back to Islam. So what we have now, in these co two competition of these two movements, I think the idea of the re-Islamization of the Muslims was successful, more successful. It won. And today, we have the, the uh, state of mind of Muslims is to come back to Islam. The, what worries me now, and that is the dilemma, and that is I want to share with you, and I think this is appropriate place to do it. I am very much worried 
what kind of Islam and what kind of direction in the name of Islam Muslim will go. This is the, this is the question not only for us Muslims, but it is pr primary our question. It is primary our problem. How the Muslims are going to handle? I see that even the ulama, with all due respect to, my, to all my colleagues, I am one of them, we are not prepared for the task that we ask to do. We are not trained. We don't understand global politics, global uh, systems. Uh, we don't understand what is happening in the world. And on the other hand, we have very poor politicians who, who are, uh, who are uh, I wouldn't say they are not intelligent, but they are frightened by these circles telling them, we are protecting you, and if you just say anything of, of, the, of the sort of the human rights, freedom, democracy, you know, this Western, you know, imported, whatever, you are in danger. So you should just speak as authoritarian as you are. And don't allow Muslims to be free. If you, let them, if you allow them to be free, they will get you out from the power. So no democracy, no free elections, no debate, uh, and then you have this uh, unwritten inheritance of them, so and so on. And then because of that, because this uh, inability of the Muslim youth, of the, of the Muslim, then they, uh, what, they are, what, what is the choice for them? They go to mosque. They, they, they stick to Islam. And they go to the Paris streets and pray Juma prayer. And then you, the French government say, you know, you cannot pray on the street anymore. Right? And then they go to Switzerland and they say, we want a minaret. And the Switzerland government say, no, 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 you cannot have minaret. And then we complain. And then Muslims complain and complain and complain. And no one listens. And then I would... Uh, this is a long one uh, because uh, Zain uh, is my friend, so I just want to pay him respect. But what I would like to conclude with, dear my Muslims, my brothers, my young, uh, please, all the, uh, come back again to the first imperative of God, Ikra, read. We have to be educated. Education is our salvation. And uh, salvation, our salvation and success in this world is in education. Even if we lose something of our identity in education, it is better than to be ignorant and to be slave to others. So please, educate yourself. When you are educated, you don't need to complain. And when you don't need to complain, you will spend your energy for creative work and not blaming others for your mistakes. You know, if Martin Luther King came in the 60s and say, I have a complaint, <laughs> did anyone listen to him? I imagine no one would listen to him. What did he say? I said, I have a dream. So I want you to say each day, together with me, I have a dream, and my dream has been fulfilled to come to Singapore to see you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think we do have a dream in Singapore, Shay. Our dream for the Muslim community is a community of excellence, a vision started by many, many previous politicians, ministers, and with MUIS together, because we believe it's important to be excellent in everything that we do. Could we invite the second uh, speaker, please? Yes, I see a lady's hand here right in front. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Mariam. And uh, uh, Sheikh Mustafa, I'm actually, uh, I'm an educator. So what I'll, I'll share with you is my insights in terms of working uh, with youth and young children in Singapore. And uh, what resonated with me is actually what you're sharing about the formation of your own uh, identity while growing up in multicultural Eastern Europe. 
And, and in Singapore, as you know, the, there's a wonderful diversity. And this, the youth tell me and their teachers that as they grow up, they know that they have to be modern and traditional. They have to be religious as well as good in the secular studies. They have to be Malay sometimes, English sometimes, Singlish sometimes, and sometimes a bit of Arabic. So one of the responses of the uh, Singaporean youth, and Singaporean youth love computer. So they tell me that one of the ways that they cope is that they learn to toggle. And they toggle well. So if it needs be, they toggle to the Islamic world. The next day they toggle to the English world, the secular world, and the modern world. I suppose this is their way of responding to that challenge of diversity in modern Singapore. So um, perhaps you can share your insights. For one, uh, the one question, the first question is, is this toggling a healthy response to the challenge of diversity? And also as an educator, I suppose my worry is that as they toggle, are they losing something? Is there any particular value that I as an educator can stress in every individual youth in Singapore that would help them to at least anchor a balance even as they toggle left and right in, in responding to the challenge of diversity. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, elaborative question. I think in your question, you, you almost taught me something that I didn't know. Thank you very much. It shows uh, the level of your awareness and consciousness. As you know, it is said that the man has the only living being that has the uh, has uh, the capacity not to be conscious at, but all, at all. He can be just, uh, uh, it is upon to him. Uh, we have the, in the Quran that tells us God, you may be believer and you may be not believer. This, this is your choice. So I recommend you that you believe, of course. But you, choice.